The next section is called Remembering Elmer Keith, May 28, 1986. When God made him, he threw away the mold. That's been said of a lot of people, most of whom were ordinary, run-of-the-mill conformists compared to Elmer Keith. The Dean of Gun Writers, Elmer, who died last February, just short of his 85th birthday, was unique. He was probably the most sworn by and sworn at figure in gun fraternity, a clan that triggers a lot of swearing. There are few, if any, hand loaders and hunters who did not know of Elmer. It was my pleasure to have known him, to have heard his tales, to talk guns and hand loading with him, and to have hunted with him many times over his last 18 years, and to have learned from him. There will never be another like him. And some will add to that, thank God, those distractors don't know what they're talking about. Don't misunderstand. I don't think Elmer was always right, but I learned that when that old man said something about guns, you'd better listen. Like he said in his last book, he had been there. I didn't always think so fondly of Elmer. Like many, uh, my attitude towards him went through a cycle. When I first started handloading, Elmer was quickly put right up there on the top with Gunlore Mountain, of the Gunlore Mountain. I devoured his words as if they were holy writ. But then, after I'd been loading and shooting for a time, and I'd begun to think I was pretty smart myself, I joined the ranks of Elmer's distractors. What silliness to think that anyone could claim to have downed a running elk at 600 yards with a handgun. What nonsense to think you need a 375 H and H to down a mere deer. This was the modern age of small bores. Hyper velocity and pinpoint accuracy. Hadn't I hammered a couple of Texas deer with my just introduced 243 Winchester Model 70? I confess, my friends, that I for years, I re that for years I regarded Elmer Keith as a joke. He was, I thought, still living in the black powder age of pumpkin balls and rainbow trajectories and getting a bit senile to boot. I first met Elmer in a, writer's, in a Remington Writers Seminar in 1966. We gathered at a downtown hotel in Washington, then took a chartered bus to Remington Farms on the eastern shore of Maryland, the heart of fabled Chesapeake Bay waterfowl hunting. As the totally green editor of the just-founded Gun Week, I ought to be I ought to be rubbing shoulders and swapping tales with the elite of gunwriting brotherhood like Warren Page, Pete Cuthloff, George Nanti, Larry Kohler, Jack O'Connor, all gone now, and a host of others whose words I've read for I'd read for years. To be truthful about it, I may have rubbed a few shoulders with them, but I sure didn't wrap any tales, swap any tales. In the first place, I didn't have any tales to swap. In the second, they wouldn't have had the slightest inclination to listen to the kid that was one the one time I kept my ears open. That was the one time I kept my ears open and my mouth shut. Elmer Keith, Keith, Elmer Keith I was glad to meet, but it was more like the youngster who wants to see a two-headed calf at a circus sideshow so he could brag about it to his buddies. I'll admit I was a bit flattered when the room assignments were announced and I learned that the kid had been honored to buck, bunk with Keith. It wasn't until later that I learned that any newcomer was assigned to share a room with Elmer, for the more experienced hands valued their sleep, to which Elmer, Gregorius' tales and buzzsaw snoring weren't conducive. If the organizers, Remington's Ted McCorley and hired Dick Dietz, had assigned one of the old pros to Elmer's room, they would have been royally cussed and Remington products threatened with slander forevermore. Announcement of the room assignments did, did bring me some attention from the writers, undoubtedly their relief that it wasn't them who told me several Elmer tales. One concerned the time that Elmer's roommate woke up in an overheated room and begun trying to open a bulky window. Suddenly the light snapped on and he looked over his shoulder at the wrong end of Elmer's forty-four Magnum, 
When time came to go to bed, sure enough, there was Elmer's forty-four on the bedside table, a gift for Smith and Wesson for help, a gift from Smith and Wesson for helping them design it. So he said. Around three a.m., I woke up stifling hot, staggered to the window, and was clam clamoring with the Venetian blinds trying to get it open. When I froze, remembering where I was and who I was with, Elmer, Elmer, it's me, Neil. Elmer never woke up, but they called Reveille before I got back to sleep. As I drew model 1100s for the morning's hunt at Remington Farms, Elmer was muttering loudly about how he wished he had his 10-gauge double and a box of three-and-a-half magnum lullaboy threes. I figure he was just complaining to remind us he's an old-timer since number three shot had him been available for a generation. Besides, it was certainly bad form to mention Western's lullaboy at a Remington party. Some years later, I learned of a mathematical analysis comparing various steel and lead shots for retained energy, energy penetration, probability of hits, etc. The best compromise among lead shot sizes for past shotting geese was number three. But Elmer knew it long before, not on the basis of some computer printout, but on the basis of years of experience. He consistently badgered the shot shell makers to come out with threes to no avail, but once Dick Deitz asked Remington Shot Tower people to provide him with some number threes, which drop while making twos and fours, Dick then had a plant load a case of them for Elmer's birthday. Elmer, he told me, was like a cowboy kid with a new pony. That morning... I assigned to shoot. I was assigned to shoot from a single rise about a hundred yards from and a bit above Elmer. I was in a perfect spot to judge distance on some of Elmer Keith's famous long shots, but it was so foggy and wet that the geese weren't flying. After quite a wait, one lone high honker, well over a hundred yards up, came over Elmer's tree. That goose was so high that I was startled when Elmer opened up. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. The goose didn't even increase her wing beat. I chuckled. A bit later, another came over. Same story. I laughed. Then another came over, closer yet, but still too far. I figured at least 80, maybe 90 yards. Kaboom, kaboom. To my astonishment, one wing froze, and the goose dropped into a sharp gliding dive. Kaboom! Elmer slammed the injured bird with an incredibly long, solid hit that sent it plummeting into the pond, deader than a hammer. By the time Elmer had his three-bird limit, I was convinced, one, he was a whale of a shot. Two, if they were within range of a 90-millimeter anti-aircraft, he would have been throwing lead. Three, his stories about long-range shotgunning were probably true. And four, he didn't have his 10-gauge double with three mag with magnum threes a year later on a remington seminar at mary meeting bay maine four of us were hunting on an island just off the coast there were mighty few ducks around so dates and i went over to a little bay where bev man and elmer were standing in the open elmer was wearing a camouflage poncho his huge light-colored cowboy hat Dick asked him if he wasn't concerned that ducks might flare from the hat. No, Dick, he said in seriousness, if they get close enough to see their hat, they're already in range. A year or so later, I hunted upland birds with Elmer for the first time at Winchester's Nilo Farms in Illinois. He had been seriously ill, I think with the recurrent heart problems, and I remember giving him a better position and thinking that I should be careful to slow my shots so 70-year-old Elmer could get some shooting. When the dog flushed the first bird before it was much over a yard off the ground and well before my sharp reflexes and young muscles had brought up my gun, Elmer hammered it. I was the one who had to hustle to get in any shooting. On another occasion, I didn't, don't even remember when or how, when or where, 
we'd done some box pigeon shooting where pigeons are placed in little steel box that fell away upon the command pull. There were fluttering rubber air hose inside the boxes designed to spook the pigeons and send them zinging away at high speed. Many of the pigeons wouldn't corroborate. If they didn't fly, the gentlemanly riders didn't shoot until they did, but not Elmer. Blam! Whether the pigeon was flying or sitting in the bird, sitting, the bird was dead. That too taught me something about Elmer. He was reared in a poor family in the frontier, where hunting wasn't for sport, but for meat. When Elmer was a kid, if you didn't hunt and hit, you might not eat. He learned to hit with the head loud, Wait, with the load that would put dinner on the table. He didn't worry about the niceties of theory or the escortia of ballistics minutia. He wanted results. There was no such thing as luxury of coming back another day or another year until he could choose a classic side view to shoot and plant his bullet with care as the sport hunter is taught to do. As, as a results hunter, he knew more times than not the only shot you'd get would be a high-tailing rump disappearing into the thicket. But unlike most, unlike most experienced pot hunters I have known, he studied the elements of internal and external ballistics, committed them to his photographic memory, and then put them to practical use, both in hunting and competition on the Idaho rifle team. Late one summer evening, while riding in the Land Rover through some heavy woods with the writer known for his advocacy of light ballistics and high velocities, we spooked a handsome elk. The elk bolted through the clearing, showing only his rump and the rear of his heavy rack. The writer mumbled, Don't ever tell someone, don't ever tell anyone I said so, but this kind of hunting, Elmer is right. Elmer once said of another writer with whom he had hunted many times, he's gone high velocity. He said sorrowfully with a shake of his head, like a long-suffering minister reporting to the congregation about a backslider, a choral master who had left his family to run off with the lead soprano. George Martin, now the head of the NRA publications, once told me about a pre-64 model 370, right, model 70, 370 H&H, 375 H and H, he'd bought, thinking that he might someday get to Africa. When he told Elmer, he snorted about it being of any value in Africa, but it's a great mule deer caliber. Elmer couldn't fathom the concept of being overgunned. He would say, "What's that? Are you afraid you'll be over dead? He'll be over dead." But a few of us can handle a gun like Elmer. <clears throat> We're better off with a rifle we can handle that allows us to place our shots and requires our shots, and requires us to place our shots. But our kids don't go hungry if we have to wait for a better shot. Sure, in Elmer's later years, he wouldn't have starved if he hadn't brought home the meat. But that wasn't the way it was in his formative years. What he learned back then worked and he saw no reason to change his ways to him it just made good sense to bring home the meat and to choose the gun that would always do it even under the most adverse circumstances the fact that most of us couldn't handle the recoil or couldn't judge the range and didn't know exactly where the bullet would hit at that distance didn't really enter his equation anyone professing to be a hunter should know he knew the trajectory of whether the rifle of whether whatever rifle he was shooting and could quote it and the exact content of the load he was using down to the make of the case and primer as if he were reading off a computer printout and not only could he judge range but he could shoot most of us had learned not to quote load data from memory but elmer could and did i often wrote down the loads he recommended and found them to be just as good as he said that's not to say they didn't sometimes hover on the edge of high-pressure destruction. Back in the late 1950s, someone sent a letter to Guns Magazine which said something like, Elmer Keith is my master. I shall not flinch. Yeah, though I, yea, though I load 2,400 with a pinch for luck, 
I shall fear no pressures, for thou art with me. Thy rod designs and thy bullets, thy comfort me, etc. I'll bet Elmer didn't think that parody of the 23rd Psalm was funny, but I yellowed, I saw a yellowed copy of that letter on the walls of Guns and Ammo more than 20 years later. I heard a lot of people describe Elmer as a liar, but not to his face. They didn't believe his exploits because they couldn't do it. And to be fair, neither Elmer nor anyone else could do it regularly, for some of the things he had done were beyond limitations of the gun, like that 600-yard running elk shot with his 44 Magnum. The only time I ever saw Elmer mad was when he talked about that long elk shot and the fact that some doubted his word. I heard him tell the story probably two dozen times, and like every other story I heard Elmer tell, it was always the same, down to the same adjectives and the same pauses. Significantly, his stories didn't get any better with passing years. Oh, didn't get better with passing years. The thing uh, that his distractors overlook is that he never recommended shooting elk or anything else with a handgun at 600 yards. The only reason he took the shot is because he thought the guy he was guiding had wounded the elk. When it came back into view on a distant mountainside, he walked his shots into the elk by knowing how much front sight he was taking, correcting his lead, and holding accordingly to the bullet splashes. As I recall, he said the fifth shot, it was the fifth shot that killed the elk. Was the shot pure skill or pure luck? Neither. It was great skill with a lot of luck. And Elmer freely admitted that the luck part. I do believe it. Do I believe it? Absolutely. Do I think I could have done it again? Not with the next shot, but within another dozen or so shots? Almost certainly. Elmer was honest when Winchester took several riders to Italy in 1967 to see their new state-of-the-art shot shell plant in Aguenti. I'll never forget Elmer retrieving his hat after lunch in a fine restaurant in Rome. Among the European fedoras, the western hats of the riders stood out starkly as crowns of a, now, of a snow-covered field. From 20 yards, you could spot Grit Greshams and Jack Lewis's and some of the others, but none was as instantly identifiable as that 10-gallon silver belly of Elmer's. Yet Elmer took that sombrero off the rack, stepped to a window for better light, and carefully inspected his name on the band before putting it on his head. He never told me anything he didn't believe to be absolutely right. And he usually was, though I didn't always think so at the time. That's not to say I think everything that appeared under his byline was gospel, for sometimes he complained about the editing which changed what he meant. That's understandable. I've seen his letters and manuscripts. He didn't believe in punctuation, particularly the period, and most of his articles had to be completely rewritten for publication. But Elmer turned a lot of people off by his dogmat dogmatism, as well as his gregariousness, particularly those who might have had more experience in certain area than Elmer had. For, ex for instance, the white hunter on Elmer's African safari with Bob Peterson and Tom Santos of Guns and Ammo. As I heard the tale, Elmer's rapacious, rapacious stories and statements of conviction were about to drive the hunter nuts late one night when helter when elmer began loudly repeating the tales just outside his tent the hunter came exploding out of the tent ready to do violence to elmer but it wasn't elmer's but it was only elmer's voice on a tape recorder placed by the impish Saitos. elmer published his first article the bullet experience on big game in the April 15, 1925, American Rifleman. Editor Chauncey Thomas commented to me, but through luck of confidence and modesty of si and silence, which seems natural to Hillmen, even bashfulness that he held back. Oh, I messed that up. April 15, 1925, American Rifleman Editor Chauncey Thomas commented, 
I have been trying to get him to allow me to publish some of his letters to me. But through his lack of confidence and modesty and silence, which seems natural to hill men, even to bashfulness, he has held back. Well, Ever Elmer never held back after that, but I'll be sure. But I'll sure agree with Thomas, closing comment about Elmer, the deaths he give can, the oh God, the details he gives can be depended on. My eyes are shot. This was the end of remembering Elmer Keith. The guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com.